Hey everyone, Ben King here with Best Practice Medicine, and this is a just-in-time training moment. This moment is designed for our colleagues who work in 911 response, especially those working in rural America, who are interested in improving their knowledge of how to care for someone with a highly infectious disease. We're of course discussing the novel coronavirus, known as COVID-19, which has become a pandemic. We know that your inboxers are filling up with an avalanche of information, links and emails and people telling you that they've canceled their events. We've not wanted to contribute to the noise, but over the last several weeks, the team here at Best Practice Medicine and myself have been repurposing our significant educational resources to provide a guiding light for what we believe to be the best practices in the 911 response to someone exhibiting signs and symptoms or complications from the COVID-19 virus. While there are many reputable sources out there and references, it can be hard to understand or digest the information in a simple, practical, how do I use this in my practice kind of way. We'll be sharing with you five best practices that we found as themes through our research and reference-based material from organizations like the CDC, the World Health Organization, and others who have been studying and looking at this virus for quite some time. I hope you'll take a few minutes to watch this video and I do sincerely hope that you'll find that the basic premises that we're proposing here are both applicable, easy to use, and help you in your response in the 911 environment to a patient presenting with signs and symptoms or complications from a COVID-19 infection. So here they are, the five best practices for EMS services in rural settings and the 911 response to COVID-19. Practice one. Use good judgment when looking for your PPE, when deciding what you're going to use to protect yourself. We know that the gold standard is an N95 particulate mask. Chances are very good that your fit test is either out of date or you have a very limited supplies of these devices. The CDC recommends that we should prioritize using our highest level protection available to us for aerosolized generating procedures. Now that's a new term for most of us. An aerosolized generating procedure, or an AGP, is a procedure which will likely increase the number of droplets in the air. Now it's important you understand COVID-19 is transmitted through droplets. It's an infection that primarily lives in the lungs, in our mucus cell and our cilia cells. And so when we cough or sneeze, those droplets go into the air. If you think about something like a nebulizer treatment, that artificially increases the number of droplets that we're putting in the air. That would be an AGP event. So again, the recommendation is that we use the highest level of protection for PPE we have available to us only when we have AGP events in the likely care of our patients. Now the CDC also recommends that once the supply chains get reestablished, everyone gets their appropriate fist test for your N95s and you wear them continuously while caring for your patients. However, you can use things like surgical masks or other masks that provide some generalized protection for your nose holes and your mouth holes. We want to prevent ourselves as much as possible from breathing in droplets of any kind. Practice two, limit the number of providers that are exposed. Now, this is one that I'm particularly worried about because we have been responding in the EMS realm in the same fashion for years, if not decades. It's going to take a while for us to get used to this new concept and it's not going to be second nature to us. The idea is this, if you have two responders, split them up and then provide someone with a driver so that only one of those trained responders, EMT, AMT, paramedic, is actually exposed to the patient. By limiting the exposure to a single responder, if that responder happens to become ill or infected or has to be quarantined, it doesn't shut down the entire service. We know many of you work in communities where you maybe only have four or five or 10 responders total. It could decimate your program if all of you ended up quarantined because everyone went into the house and we get it. These are our neighbors and our communities that we live in, but you have to practice really strong discipline to only expose the people that absolutely have to be. And in many cases, that's just a single provider. On a quick side note, this is not the time to encourage riders in your ambulance. Family members, loved ones should find their own methods of travel, preferably in vehicles that are not owned or operated by other people on your service so as to limit the exposure to everyone. 
The state of Montana, along with a number of other states, has been providing waivers to EMS services so that you don't have to worry about the licensing and rules that require, in most circumstances, two emergency care providers to be present for any ambulance transport. Look out for the references in this just-in-time training video that will show you where you can find that waiver if you practice in the state of Montana. Practice three, isolate the cab from the patient care portion of your ambulance. Let's just call it the box today. So there's a couple of things with this. One, we don't want to expose whoever's driving or operating the ambulance, whether it's while we have a patient in here or after to the call or getting ready to go to the next one. So there's a couple of basic precautions we can take. If you have a pass through that's got a door or a window in it of some kind, go ahead and close that. Two, you can take it that another step and put some plastic over it. Just some basic six mil plastic from your local hardware store with some duct tape, we recommend a strength rating of greater than four, will help seal off the cab portion of your ambulance. Also, you can look to see whether or not your circulatory system for your air exchangers is connected. What I mean by that is you wanna see that the air that's being pumped into the box portion of your ambulance is separate from the air that's being circulated in the cab. If that's not the case, it's time for some of you farm mechanics to figure out how to disconnect those systems or make sure that you're preventing the recirculation of air from the box to the cab. Lastly, when you're operating your ambulance these days, it's a great idea to use your exhaust fan. Now, this is also an opportunity for your mechanics to get in there, put a little oil on the fan, tune it up a little bit, make sure it's optimized because by moving air out of your ambulance, you're creating a de facto, almost negative pressure room. Now, not really, but kind of. And it's a little step that we can take to help keep us as safe as we possibly can be. So step three, isolate the box from the cab of the ambulance. Practice four, clean up your tchotchkes. You know who I'm talking about. If you look at the action area of almost any ambulances, you'll find all sorts of stuff. This stuff might be useful to you under normal circumstances, but during a pandemic where we're concerned about droplet-based transmission, this is just another way for us to <coughs> infect ourselves later on. A study conducted in Hamilton, Montana at a lab there just recently discovered that coronavirus is viable on stainless steel surfaces for up to 72 hours, and it's viable on cardboard surfaces for up to 24 hours. That means that if you touch it, and then you touch your face three days after the droplet has been deposited on a stainless steel surface, you could become infected. Think about what your ambulances are. They're mostly stainless steel and cardboard. So eliminate anything that is superfluous, that's extra, that you don't really need, that's just gonna make it more difficult to get your ambulance, ambulance decontaminated. It's a great time to do some spring cleaning. Now this doesn't mean that you have to throw anything out or even that you have to take it out of the ambulance, but simply putting it behind a plexiglass door or into a compartment will seriously help keep things cleaner for you and your team as you take care of patients out in the field. Practice four, get rid of the tchotchkes. Practice five, decontamination is no joke. We need to be meticulous and thoughtful in the process that we use to clean our ambulances. Now, if we've practiced good hygiene up to this point, we should have maintained most of the airborne droplets in the patient care compartment of the ambulance. The CDC recommends that when you arrive at a hospital, you leave the doors of your ambulance open. Again, we said ventilation is your friend. Being able to move air, fresh air through your ambulances is gonna be helpful in reducing the amount of virus that you may be dealing with. Additionally, the CDC recommends the use of an EPA approved disinfectant. Now, we recognize that the supply chain is being challenged and stressed at this moment, and you may not have sufficient quantities to thoroughly clean the back of your ambulance. If that's the case, bleach is a recognized alternative to other commercially available disinfectants. If you mix the bleach with a third of cup per one gallon of water, that should be a high enough concentration to kill any coronavirus that may be on surfaces in the back of your ambulance. Remember that disinfectants are not designed to be used instantaneously. That is to say that they need some soak time once they hit the surfaces that you're cleaning. For bleach, the recommendation is allow the bleach to sit on surfaces you're cleaning for a minimum of 10 minutes. After that it's sat there for 10 minutes, wipe it up and dispose of both your gloves 
and any personal protective equipment you're using during the decontamination process. A quick note on PPE. It may be appropriate to use the same PPE that you had on while transporting the patient. This is not ideal, however, some protection is better than none. You have to be worried, though, about transferring the virus back into the ambulance as you're decontaminating it. So at the very least, do your best to change your gloves and wipe down any obvious splatter you may have. Practice five, decontamination is no joke. Take it seriously. So in summary, the five best practices for responding to a COVID-19 patient in a 911 setting are, one, use good judgment when choosing your PPE. Two, limit the number of providers who are being exposed. Three, isolate the cab from the box. Four, clean up your tchotchkes. And five, remember decontamination is no joke. We hope that you've enjoyed these five best practices for responding to a COVID-19 patient. This is the first in a series of just-in-time trainings we plan on providing to our colleagues in the emergency medical community, as well as those working in critical access hospitals in rural environments. The team and I here at Best Practice Medicine are committed to bringing you researched best practices as we prepare and respond to this pandemic.